Volunteers. They have have ordered. They placed an order for sixteen hundred pounds of food that has been a, that was. Let me start over, okay? <laughs> there will be an order of sixteen hundred pounds of food on Tuesday morning. Help is appreciated. Please contact Linda Breedlove for more information. Sunshine Crew begins this Wednesday, three thirty to four thirty. Children ages. K-4 through 4th grade are welcome to join in on all the fun. If you haven't registered yet, please visit the church website at fumcjacksonal.org, children's-ministries, hashtag, um, or contact Fortune Sheffield. If you have been attending FUMC and want to join as a member of our church, now's a great time. Let Pastor Ralph know. He would love to talk to you about being a member of FUMC. There will be a leadership council meeting Wednesday night, September the 7th at 5.30 in the Wesley Bible class. You're encouraged to attend. This is a special meeting. It's not our regular meeting. And everyone is welcome to attend this meeting. You don't have to just be a member of the leadership council to attend. There is, there is a no harshness committee meeting on the 5th, which is tomorrow. Senior Citizens Lunch will begin on September the 13th at noon. This is the lunch we do with the Baptists. So we're hosting September and then the Baptists will host in October. So this is, we're starting this back again. We did this, we've done this for several years, but during COVID we quit having it, so we started it back. Uh, you can always check all the meetings and events on the church website at funcjacksonal.org. Also, today's Communion Sunday. If you didn't get your little communion cup when you came in, raise your hand and the ushers can bring you one. Uh, sometimes some people don't know to pick up or they just miss them. So I just want to remind you, be sure to get your communion cup. Thank you. I promise we do more than meet and eat. But the meetings and the eatings are on the church calendar at the church website. So uh, that's the easiest way for us to get everybody uh, word out to everyone. So if you've got a question about when a meeting is occurring or when, when an eating is occurring, uh, check the church website, or the Facebook page and all of that sort of thing. I'm grateful that you're here. If you're here as a guest, we would love for you to... Uh, to take this tear-off sheet and fill it out. Give us a 
give us a way of contacting you so we can share a little bit more about our church's ministry. Also on the back, some of us forget, there's a place for a prayer request or a praise report. And uh, we'd love to have praise reports and prayer requests. We like to pray, but we love to hear praise, right? So I encourage you to, to take time to fill that out. Join me as we begin worship this morning. Stand as you are able. Come all who labor and are weighed down with responsibility, uncertainty, and worry. We, we come because the load we carry is heavier than we can bear alone. Come, all you who seek to relate work and worship, leisure and service into a meaningful whole. We gather for spiritual renewal and practical challenge, for help in making choices and carrying out our commitments. Come, sinner and saint, with your hatreds and loves, your failures and successes, your sorrows and joys. We respond to the Spirit's leading and open ourselves to receive God's gracious gifts. Amen. Let us pray. God of power and mercy, only with your help can we offer you fitting service and praise. May we live the faith we profess and trust your promise of eternal life. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever and ever. Amen. 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 Our, first, our first hymn is page 160. Rejoice, ye pure in heart. We'll sing the first, second, third, and fifth verses. <clears throat> our faith together this morning, you'll find the Apostles' Creed printed in your worship bulletin. We confess our faith saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Bless you. You may be seated this morning. It is our joy and part of our work and, and, and praise as disciples of Jesus Christ to give. I once uh, had a, a fellow in my one of my churches who had never heard anybody talk about the joy of giving. He said, you know, it is a joy. I was like, yeah, and you're old enough to know that, but apparently nobody had ever told him. To him, it was a chore. But when you give and you know that good is being done with what you give, it is a joy. It's a joy to help feed the poor. It's a joy to help clothe those who need clothing. It's a joy to help those who are hurting in body, mind, and spirit. Not only in our own community, but all around the world. And your giving, in part, does that. I am grateful, grateful, grateful for your faithfulness in financial matters. We're going to receive the Lord's tithes and offerings this morning. God, thank you for the pleasure and the privilege we have to give. May all that we give honor you and praise you and your Son and the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
doxology and praise and thanksgiving. moments, and in the quietness of this moment, let us name before the Lord in our hearts those people who we've promised to pray for, those people who are on our hearts and our minds this morning. in your mercy hear our prayers God and Father of us all as the sun rises to bring in the new day we remember those who descend into the earth their work begins in darkness pulling from the earth the resources that we steward we remember those who work inside a building away from the light and the brightness of the day. We remember those who work outside in the harsh elements of our world, in bitter cold and sweltering heat. We remember those this morning who do not have a job to go to, who are struggling to meet the needs of their daily living expenses, for whom the day becomes even longer and more arduous. And tonight, as the sun sets in the evening of rest, we remember those who work at night. We remember those who are trying to recover from their labor and toils of the day. We remember those whose work is unsafe and often dangerous. We pray for a renewed sense of dignity in their lives and in their work and in our lives and in our work. God, in your goodness, you've made a home for all of us. You've made a home for the worker. Make a place in our hearts for compassion for the men and women who labor tirelessly for, for basic necessities. Ensure a place for the men and women who are struggling to find work. Grant us your wisdom to greet and care for those who are unable to work because of illness or circumstances that prevent their participation. We pray for the children around the world who are not able to run and play, but instead must put in a hard day's work to help their family to be able to eat, to live. Be with us all, Christ Jesus, as we go about the busyness of our work. Hold us accountable not only for our actions, but most importantly, for our neighbors. May we continue to work together to bring about your kingdom. This we ask through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Today is Luke 14, 25 through 33. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the ones who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So, for, so therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. You may be seated, thank you. So, we're going to sit a couple of minutes with what Jesus just said, because uh, that's a hard thing. Now, for those of you who've been in the church longer than some of us have been alive, I want to encourage you to do away with the last 80 years of church memory and pretend you're just somebody 
that's just walking along, following this uh, peripatetic rabbi. It's a fancy word. It means just walk around. That's what Jesus did, right? Or did I need to explain that? You know, right? But right. you're a, you're a peripatetic nurse, aren't you? <laughs> she just walks around. <laughs> Jesus walked around teaching people. And he's got this huge crowd following him. Now, I tend to not tell people to hate their parents to grow a church. I, I just don't. Maybe it's worked in the past, but I really have a hard time saying that. But, but Jesus has this huge crowd of people following him. Some of them are disciples. Some of them are followers. And some of them just showed up to see what all the fuss was about. Those of you who've been to a football game, you know how that is. Some people are supporters. Some people are shower-uppers. And others just want to see who's going to get in the fight. Right? It's like watching NASCAR. Some of us want to see somebody win, but we all want to see who's fixed to have a wreck, right? As long as they don't get killed, we feel bad about it briefly when somebody gets killed. But we want to see the wreck. Jesus turns to this group of people and says, Whoever does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. That is, that's a lot, y'all. <laughs> that's a, Derek Weber says, why does Jesus make it so hard to follow him? Well, why does Jesus have to make it so hard to follow him? He says, follow me, but then we've got to leave everything behind to do so. Why? Why can't we add it to our long list of, of everything and other interests that we need to do? Our, our overfull schedule of appointments and good deeds. Why can't Jesus just be satisfied giving him what time we have? At least that's something, right? At least we're giving it a try, Derek Weber says, when we can When nothing else is going on, when the kids aren't in town, when we haven't been out too late the night before, and surely that ought to count for something. Jesus says, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. And then on down in verse 27, he says, oh, and... Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, mind you, we're on the other side of the cross. It hadn't happened yet. The crucifixion hasn't happened. Jesus has not died for our sins. Jesus is still the peripatetic rabbi walking around. And for all of the people who are listening, the cross is not bright and shiny and gold. The cross is a symbol of a criminal who's done terrible, awful things against the Roman state. And it's a terrible way to die. What is he talking about? Pick up a cross. The last thing I want to do is pick up a cross. That means I'm guilty of something. Whether I am or not, I look guilty. And the only reason you pick it up and tote it is because you're fixing to get nailed to it. Why in the world is what is wrong with this man telling me to hate my mom and daddy and telling me to pick up a cross? What is wrong? I, I don't like my brother or sister too much. I can hate on them pretty good. But, but, but my kids, I like my kids so far. They're not teenagers yet, right? Y'all, teenagers are not that bad. They're really nice people. They're just trying to figure out their way in this world. And we were all teenagers at some point. Some of us still are. Let's admit, this is a hard saying. And it would stir a response in any of us. And we would have words with Jesus. Probably, if we, especially if we just met. That man crazy. I'm not following him another step. I'm going to go back home. And you couldn't blame him. I mean, hate's a strong word. And our world shows us 
Our world does a really good job of showing us how to hate. I mean, it is football season after all, right? By the way, go dogs. Georgia and Georgia Tech have, I don't know how long the rivalry is. It seems now like hundreds of years. But the name of the rivalry is Clean Old Fashioned Hate. If you Google Clean Old Fashioned Hate, it brings up a Wikipedia article about Georgia and Georgia Tech in football. Isn't that great? We have our own Wikipedia. It, clean old fashioned hate. It's kind of like Alabama Auburn, only, well, it's a lot like Alabama Auburn. So Jesus wants me to hate my mom and daddy to follow him. Brother, sister, wife, kids. I can tell you the answer that probably flew out of people's mouths. It would be the same answer that would fly out of your mouth before you thought about it. And that answer would be no. Now in the church, we, we like to be nice about it. We've got Christianese and, and we, you know, well, that's really not what Jesus... You know. When Jesus said it in Luke 14, no was probably the first word out of somebody's mouth. It would have been the first word out of my mouth. Not going to happen. Not going to hate my mom and daddy. Now, I want to be sensitive and I want to take into account I know people and you know people and you may be that people. Your experience in home with your mother and father has been one of abuse and violence and the only reasonable answer in your life is to hate your mother and father. I get it. I'm sorry. We don't need to beat up on people who say they hate their mama and daddy. How does this work itself out in our lives? It's the word of God. Jesus said to do it. How does it work itself out in our lives? Elsewhere, Jesus has said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We pray every Sunday morning, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Jesus says to forgive. Jesus said to forgive 70 times 7. So how does that love in Jesus and that forgive in Jesus, how does that square up with hate to mom and daddy? And I'm almost certain Jesus sounded Southern when he said, how does that square up? That's an honest question. If you hadn't been in church all your life, you wouldn't be hanging around for the answer. It's an honest question. People want to know what in the world this part of the this part of the Bible doesn't make sense compared to the rest of it. So while the crowd is reeling from Jesus telling them to hate mother and father, sister and brother, wife and kids, and hate their own life itself, he starts talking about building a tower. You know. And then he says, or, or it's like a man, a king going to war. And people are trying to figure out what is all, what hate, build, what war, what? Carolyn Sharp says, concerning the illustration of building a tower, how can any disciple assess, access in advance whether they have the resources to stand firm in the face of, of social ostracization, exile, incarceration, Remember, we had disciples that wound up in jail. Torture or threat of execution. How could they now, at this point in the scripture, how could they have any knowledge or any idea of what it was going to take to face all of that? She says, remember in all four gospels, Peter learns in advance about an upcoming moment of betrayal his threefold denial of Jesus and nevertheless will be unable to avoid that heartbreaking renunciation of allegiance to his Lord. Remember, Peter 
denied Christ the third time, and then the rooster crowed. And it's an image, maybe it's driven by Southern guilt. I don't know. Maybe it's driven because I grew up in Dry Valley Baptist Church. I don't know. But the image of Peter every morning after that with a rooster crowing just tells me that in his mind, he wakes up remembering. How would you like to be reminded of your betrayal every morning? In Peter's case, though, it doesn't end there. Jesus restored him. Jesus forgave him. And so as that rooster crows the first time, perhaps he does remember his betrayal. But when he crows the second time, he remembers Christ's love and forgiveness and restoration. Carolyn Sharp says, Concerning the illustration of battling a stronger adversary, how could Jesus' followers hope to overcome the legions arrayed against them? Whether the enemy is, is imagined as, a, as a, a Roman general or as Paul would talk about the spiritual forces of darkness and wickedness. How could these folks in this moment have any idea of what they might face? But Jesus is trying to prepare them. So what do we do with all of this? I'm going to quote Derek Weber several times, but he says we could pretend we didn't read it. Right? I mean, there are other things in the Bible that we read and ignore. I'm just saying, it's a white lie. What's a white lie? White is an adjective. Lie is the object. If it's a lie, it's a lie. Well, I didn't lie. I just didn't tell everything. Well, which part did you leave out? The truth? <laughs> well, I didn't really steal money. I just didn't work for four hours in my eight-hour day. Most of us really probably only work four hours in an eight-hour day. By the way, the rest of it's spent doing whatever happens in those other four hours. <laughs> how, do, how do we handle this? We can't ignore it because we've read it. And if we've read it, we're responsible for it. Remember back in 2019, we were talking about stewardship and I came up with the slogan, Trio, the responsibility is ours. If we've read it, we're responsible for it. Give up your possessions, Jesus says at the end of our passage. Again, Derek Weber, you can't be serious. He, he can't be serious, but he is. Give it up and follow him. Carry the cross which, on which hangs father, mother, wife, children, your own life, everything. Here's what he asks. Don't love them with your love. Love them with mine. Oh, wait. So when Jesus says to hate father, mother, sister, brother, wife, children, life. So he didn't mean hate like I know hate. Again, Derek Weber. Don't love them with your love. Love them with mine, Jesus says. Don't cling to people because they meet your needs or serve you. Receive them as a gift from the one you follow. <coughs> one of my seminary professors, Dr. C. Richard Wells, went on to be the president of Dallas Theological Seminary. He had, uh, he had alt with goodwill. Back in the 90s, goodwill had this uh, slogan, give till you get that goodwill feeling. Right? Give till you get that goodwill feeling. Now his problem with goodwill was you're supposed to give. Period. Because if you give expecting something in return, that's not what Jesus said. Give. Heap up to overflowing, he says in one place. We're to give. Because it's the right thing to do. 
that feeling good about it really sounds like you did one thing so you could get another. And really, that's not what Jesus is saying. Give. Give. We need to love people with the love that Jesus has because we can't love them like they need to be loved. We can't even love them like we want to love them. But in his love, Derek Weber says, in his love, we can love the way he loves. Compared to his love working through us, ours is feeble and broken and selfish and temporary. And compared to his love, our love looks like hate. So give that kind of love up. It doesn't serve. Instead, we can love as he loves. We can see through his eyes. We can serve with his hands. Then when we pick up in his love those we call family, we find more than we thought we had. When we begin to build, we might actually finish, even as we are being finished in Him. A friend who's going through a time of deep grief and sorrow. This is familiar. You've heard people say it. You've probably said it yourself. I don't know how anyone could get through this without Jesus. Now that sounds somewhat simplistic. But it is profound. The faith you have in Christ because of the love you've experienced in Christ is what enables you to get through whatever it is. Pick up whatever cross needs to be picked up and towed it all the way to Calvary. The kingdom of God is not about a building or a war with some earthly power. It isn't about creating a theocracy and enforcing legislative morality. The kingdom of God is about changing the way you live and the way you love. The kingdom of God is about covenant and relationships, love and mercy, grace and faith. It costs a lot to do that. It's a lot easier just to hate and to be hated. Then you're justified in your hate. It's so much easier. It's so much easier. I, I would ask you all to start writing down a list of things you hate. That little bitter piece in the pecan. That shell of pecan that winds up in the pecan pie. I hate that. People who drive slow in the left lane. We all know the left lane is for people who can afford tickets, and so get out of here. It costs so much to love and to be merciful and to be gracious. Jesus counted the cost of loving us and loves us still. With all of your hate. With all of your greediness. With all of your selfishness. With all of your failures and foibles and weaknesses. Jesus loves you. I used to say Jesus loves me in spite of myself. And then a friend reminded me. If Jesus didn't love you. <laughs> just say Jesus loves you. Not in spite of yourself, it's because of who you are that Jesus loves you. You're a child of God. It takes everything to follow Jesus. And it's too great for us to do it on our own. That's why we have him. That's why we have Jesus. Jesus counted the cost of loving us and loves us anyway, giving himself up for us. I want to encourage you to follow Jesus in love. If you will follow Jesus in love, then those words that you have with Jesus will be a source of faith, hope, and love 
not fear and despair and hate. Follow Jesus in love through his love. Let's have a word with Jesus right now. Jesus, thank you that you didn't stop and hate your father and mother. Thank you, Jesus, that you didn't stop when people gave up and turned around. Thank you, Jesus, that you forgive our hate and our hatefulness. Thank you, Jesus, that you don't give up on us. Thank you, Lord, that there is joy in heaven over the one sinner who repents. For we are that one sinner. Remind us, O oh Lord, that the words we have with you are words that give us hope, words that restore our faith, words that challenge us to love with us, with a love that is beyond comprehension. Because we love with your love. Change our heart, O oh God. Make them ever new. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We're going to celebrate Holy Communion. It is our celebration of the greatest act of love where Jesus gave his life. Again, he counted the cost and loved us and continues to love us. Our celebration of Holy Communion begins on page 12 in your memory. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. We give you thanks for those things, those people, those blessings in our lives that often go unnoticed until we close our eyes to rest. We're grateful for the sunlight, grateful for the rain, grateful for the lives that you've given us to live. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for me for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon all us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by His blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at His heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours now and forever, Almighty Father. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray as our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Scripture tells us that um, as the disciples finished their meal, they sang a hymn, and then they went out to serve Jesus. Our last hymn this morning is in a, in a handout uh, for you in your, in your worship bulletin, Living for Jesus. Let us sing the first, second, and fourth verses. Please stand as you're able.
Amen. Thank you so much for coming to worship together with us. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.